It's, I'm always thrilled to be in Canada. I went to school at the University of Rochester in the wilds of upstate New York. Though I've been told Ontario is a marginal part of Canada, I would look across the lake towards civilization. And having been rejected by a Canadian woman for marriage, you were delivered from having to have me around. So uh, it's kind of a sad story, really, and I'm still working out my pain <laughs> on you today. So uh, do what I can uh, to get over it. No, I like going to Canada because if you're named John Mark, it was one of the few places in the world where I sounded like a Star Trek character. <laughs> Welcome, Jean Mark. Haha. <laughs> so I'm from rural West Virginia originally, and we were just, hey, John Mark, get over here. Billy Bob wants to help you. Just, <laughs> Totally different sound than I would get when I go to Canada. Now, we're going to talk about competing worldviews today and try to understand them. And I'd like to suggest that we end up in a war between competing worldviews because most of us, if we aren't careful, fall into a highly technical, you have to have a PhD in philosophy to use this term, phenomena called being a jerk. I blog for the Washington Post every week on their On Faith column, and here's one response to what I wrote this week. Once someone talks about a God, the God's desire, and the alleged righteousness of said God, everything else the person says must be discounted. Ha! Wow! You no longer have to get into an argument with people. I wish I had known this in grad school. It would have saved me a lot of time. Referencing an invisible, non-existent entity shows neither intellectual rigor nor common sense. If you cannot understand this, then you need to go study analytic reasoning, mythology, history, and literary criticism. Notice, in fact, this person could just look at my bio and see that I studied all those things at a secular university. That's what I do for a living. But if I have the wrong opinions, what I did, it doesn't count. If you cannot understand this, if it it is truly the uneducated and undereducated who insist on maintaining these absurd, primitive, and harmful religious beliefs. Freedom of religion should be called the freedom to prevent progress through ignorance. So I get, this is the email I get every week, Now, I have really good friends and colleagues, not at Biola, but inside of philosophy, who are atheists. And when I chat with them, I discover that they get equally obnoxious emails from Christians. And if I had one from this week, I would read it for you. But I know this, whenever they come and visit me and teach my students, they'll run into a parent who will say something like this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Fool. (laughs) This is an effective way of witnessing and showing the love of God to people. (laughs) It's also an effective way of showing that you never learned how to read a book. Because contextually, the verse, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, applies to believers, not to non-believers. Contextually, the Bible is saying there's a certain kind of person who believes in God, says there is a God, and then acts in their private behavior as if God didn't exist. That's the essence of folly. That's knowing that something's bad for your health, knowing in fact that it's currently killing you, but pretending you are the world's exception to the general rule. It's the kid I met who was about five foot four and spent all of his time playing basketball because he was going to play in the NBA. And he couldn't start for our Division D high school, whose best player in the history of the school had sat on the bench for four years at Syracuse. And I said, here's a, just a novel thought. If you put half the time you're spending on basketball into studying, you'd be better off. And he looked at me and said, don't steal my dream. They cut Michael Jordan from his high school basketball team. 
Now, the problem with this person isn't that they didn't have a dream. They did have a dream. And it wasn't that their dream wouldn't have been desirable. I wish it could have come to pass. It was that their dream was entirely irrational. And they were clinging to it. So I'd like to suggest that there are three kinds of people that fit into this general kind of I'm a jerk worldview. There's the religious non-believer who assumes they don't have to think at all about religious claims because they know somehow because Dawkins spoke in their ear, Richard Dawkins spoke in their heart and said, religious people are stupid. That, that's just bad reasoning. Now, it may be wrong to be religious, but I'm going to suggest to you that equally stupid is someone who thinks it's stupid to be an atheist or agnostic, or you have to be particularly wicked. I know Christians who think all atheists are secret Satanists, which is a weird thing for an atheist to be since they don't even believe in God. <laughs> we don't have to consider whether atheism is true and why people find it attractive or desirable because we kind of know ahead of time that those people just want to, I don't know, sleep with their girlfriend or something. And so they've gotten rid of Christian morality for bad reasons. And then there's the third kind of person that believes whatever they believe because they just have a wish. I wish I had a million dollars. I wish there was a God. I wish there was no God. I'll point out to you that in ancient philosophy, I sometimes get told, hey, you're a Christian just because you want it to be true. I'm never sure how to respond to that, except to say, yes, why would you believe something unless you had to that you didn't want to be true? That I want it to be true is a great reason to investigate whether it could be true. I'd love to have a million dollars in the bank the minute you give me any evidence that I might, even highly improbable evidence. I'll take at least a little bit of time to investigate it, because I'd love to have a million dollars in the bank. The fact that I want something to be true actually is a good motive for investigating it. Now, atheism itself was born as a formal belief system because people wanted it to be true. I'm not attacking it by saying that, but ancient atheists said, we want to live a happy life. And the largest deterrent to a happy life is fear. And the greatest fear in a world where the gods were the gods of Homer and Hesiod is that there is no exit from the cosmos. That if you die, you just go on and on being the plaything of Zeus. You know, nobody puts smile God loves you on the back of a chariot in the ancient world because that... <laughs> Smile God Loves You was a prelude to rape, not to a relationship. Whether you were male or female, whether you were the young man Ganymede or a young woman, if Zeus decided he loved you, you were in big trouble. And as Achilles points out, it's better to be anything alive on earth, a pig herder, goat herder, than a hero in Hades. Because there you're just a gibbering shade, a plaything of the gods. As Hamlet points out, if death is to sleep, given the burdens we have to bear in this life, death isn't that bad. But what if you dream, even? Aye, there's the rub. What dreams may come. And so if we could know that after we die, there is nothing that would cut off certain positive things, possibilities, but it would also cut off all possibilities of fear. That God exists doesn't mean he's good. That God exists doesn't mean he has a plan for your life, or that he loves you. That God exists may mean that he's toying with you. My friends who are atheists at least get this right because they're philosophers, 
But I want to say something to you as clearly as I can if you're not a religious believer today. The problem of evil does not show that atheism is true. It does nothing to advance the case for atheism. Though I think it is the greatest difficulty for Christian theism. Christian theism says there is a God and a pattern and a design to the universe and that God is good. That God is all-powerful and God is good and reality is real. It's not an illusion, which means evil is real. This, right from the beginning, both Jewish and Christian thinkers realized, set up a difficulty. If God is good and all-powerful, then why do bad things, seemingly random, gratuitous bad things, happen to good people? Notice, if Zeus is God, nobody could generate this problem. If God were omnipotent and wicked, if to avoid boredom, he's playing with you, where hope is just a fraud that God puts on you so that you won't kill yourself, that would go a long ways to explaining evil and there'd still be a God. In other words, you could explain evil and the design of the universe one of two ways. You could say like Plato, God is the creator and very powerful but not omnipotent. That's Plato's God in Timaeus. And that would explain why is there evil and yet designed to the universe, but imperfect design? God is good, but not all powerful. He does the best he can. On the other hand, you could just decide God is perverse, all powerful and evil. In other words, the problem of evil doesn't get you close to atheism at all. What it does is refute a certain kind of theism, namely the dominant kind in Canada and the United States, Judeo-Christian and Islamic theism, that postulate an all-good, all-powerful creator God. And it's important that we realize that, because if you're going to argue against something or for something, you at least ought to know what you're arguing for. But notice, jerkism doesn't really have to argue for anything. It knows what it believes ahead of time and simply looks for excuses to defend itself. Now I'd like to start at the beginning because Julie Andrews tells me it's a very good place to start. (laughs) And I don't know about the Bible, but I'm convinced the sound of music is inerrant. (laughs) Not, Not really on both of those things, but Now, I'll start at the beginning and say this. As we look at worldviews, here's a strong claim. Atheists may be right. Theists may be right. Christian theists may be right. To be sure that you're right is to betray jerkism. Because about anything interesting, surety is unlikely to happen to you. I'm sure that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that within English, all unmarried men are bachelors. I am not sure that you exist. Now, some of you are wishing I did not exist, because this is the very kind of thing you fear that philosophers will say. I'm in the only profession in the Bible that's rebuked right away vain philosophers. Well, the good news is, looking the way I do, I was never tempted to vanity. I looked in the mirror and said, oh, the problem of evil, it confronts me right now. (laughs) But that's the way it goes. No, here's the truth of it. You have a useful sense of knowledge about the world, about your own existence. I think you can't have meaningful doubts. About anyone else's existence, however, you can have doubts more or less reasonably. What this means is, if by knowledge you mean being sure, you don't know very much. I don't know very much. You already knew that. Philosophers, our job is to tell you you don't know very much. Those who can't teach. 
Those who can't teach, teach at a university. And those who can't teach at a university become philosophers because the only difference between a philosopher and a pizza is that a pizza can feed a family of four and a <laughs> philosopher cannot. So I already know that mostly I'm irrelevant, but all I'm suggesting to a group that's probably mostly religious believers or skeptics, and skepticism is a good thing, it's a Christian attribute, is that you're not sure. By the way, the kind of knowledge that you have when you're not sure, what's the Greek for that? The word we translate faith. Here's good news if you're a Christian. You think you're saved by, which is a knowledge word. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. Pistes and forms of it, we translate faith. In some ways, we should translate it knowing, but knowing in a certain way. Knowing where we could be wrong, but we believe best evidence and best experience points in that direction. I was at a party, and I looked across the room, and I saw hope. No, not the virtue, but the woman. And I'd known her all through high school, and she would never give me the time of day. But here was good news. We had both come to a party that turned out to be tuxedo, white tie for men, formal attire for women. And they hadn't given us the memo. We looked worse than the people waiting on the tables. We were like the slum children in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, where Christmas past open, or Christmas present opens his robe and shows ignorance and want. We look like ignorance and want at this, at this gathering. Now, here was the good news if you were John Mark. The most beautiful woman at the party was dressed like I was. It was the only thing we had in common. If she had been dressed appropriately like a meteor shooting through the sky, no one would have noticed me. But I had to stand with her. So I sidled over and I actually had a good opening line. I didn't have to say, what's your sign? A line that never has worked for me. I, I think it's because I think they're gonna say stop or yield or something like that. <laughs> And then they say cancer, and I say, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it just doesn't work for me. I don't know. Maybe you can explain it to me later. No, I walked up across to her, and I asked her out. And a week later, we were engaged. Don't try this at home. <laughs> but this is our 25th year, and I love her more than the day I first saw her. Now, the truth is, if you're in love, if you're in love and you want to stay in love, you're always full of wonder. I wonder why she married me. <laughs> I'm away from hope right now. I'll come back to Los Angeles and I wonder what woman will meet me at the airport. Sometimes the woman that meets me at the airport is so amorous that life is good. Sometimes our four children have wreaked havoc, destroyed Western civilization, and I wonder if Paul wasn't right about the merits of celibacy. <laughs> I want to suggest something to you strongly. Wonder is the essence of love when it comes to a person. Because you cannot know a person, finally, they keep growing and changing. And I know men who understand their wives, by which I mean they understand the 25-year-old woman they married 20 years ago, not the woman they're married to. And they wonder why their marriage has grown cold. It's because they are making love to a woman that does not exist anymore. People, here's my radical assertion, 
persons, even if they weren't human persons, aren't the kinds of things that you can exhaustively know about and get done with because they have personalities and they expect to be treated differently than objects. So wonder, skepticism, if you will, in Greek, is the essence of love. Now I've said two things. I've said that we all must live by uncertain knowledge. But it's knowledge in a useful sense. We're not certain about it, but it's the best we can do and we've got to move forward. We call that faith. The second category of things is wondering about people. If you want to like somebody, you have to wonder about them. Will she like this? Am I doing this correctly? I wonder. I wonder what she's thinking today because it's different. Though it's similar to what she thought yesterday, it grows and it changes. So the second truth is that love, another great Christian passion or virtue, demands skepticism. So first of all, we're not sure we're right as Christians. And we're not sure that our friends who are atheists are wrong. We think they are. Now that doesn't make us wimpy. We have committed ourselves to a particular point of view because we think best reason and best experience demands it. Here's why I'm a religious believer or a Christian given what I've just said to you. First of all, I had to ask myself when I was in grad school, do I live in a cosmos or in chaos? Two nice Greek terms because the Greeks first asked this question. Does the universe seem mostly ordered to me? That's really what cosmos meant originally. Or does it seem disordered? Put another way. Is the order I see an illusion, and if you scratch the surface, the universe doesn't make sense? Or is the chaos I see, and by this I don't mean chaos theory in science, I mean randomness, disorder, apparent, and there's a deep structure, what the Greeks would have called a logos, to the universe. Is there a beginning, an RK? By the way, that's John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, that doesn't mean a point in time, but a structural point, there was the Word, an underlying order or reason. And the Word was with God, and the Word wasn't just with God, He was God. By the way, that means the Greek makes no sense if you're a Jehovah's Witness. It can't, you can't have multiple logoi. The point of being the logos is that you're the underarching rational support for the cosmos. Here's good news if you're a Christian. The person who developed all these terms was a guy named Heraclitus of Ephesus, one of the first great philosophers in the history of ideas. Heraclitus is most famous uh, for having inspired the film Pocahontas, the Disney film Pocahontas. In a weird way, all the philosophy behind it is Heraclitean. You have this Native American princess in the woods, and what does she sing? You can never step in a river what? Twice. Well, the first time I saw the film, I yelled, Heraclitus! That's the most famous thing he ever said. Now, how in the 17th century an Indian princess knew Heraclitean philosophy is a great miracle? I don't know. It may have something to do with Disney animators and not with Pocahontas. But the idea that the cosmos is always changing, like a river, and yet there are river banks, the logos, so the river is always changing, the water. Yet you can step in the same Nile that Cleopatra stepped into. Because the river, as an idea, doesn't change, but the water changes. You can't step in the same water, or exactly the same river. Now, is that true? The next most famous resident of the city of Ephesus, after Heraclitus lived, anyone want to guess who that was? The Apostle John. 
who worked inside of the community and said, oh, there is a Logos. And the Logos is God. And the universe does make sense. So far he said nothing new. Everybody in Ephesus is going right. Okay, we know that already. Heraclitus told us. But Heraclitus had a problem. He was such a miserable person. He hated people so much that they told this story about him before he died. They said about Heraclitus that he believed fire was the essence of health. After all, people who are warm are alive. People who are cold are dead. So as he began to die, Heraclitus realized he needed to heat himself up, but he knew enough not to put himself inside a fire. Sensible. So he needed some way to heat himself up without burning up. And he noticed that on a cold day, steam would rise up from fields, namely from cow poops. And so he had an idea. He had himself buried in cow poop. Unfortunately, the air thing escaped him. And so Heraclitus became the first philosopher ever to die in his own BS. <laughs> this is really true. It really happened. That, that, that really is the story of Heraclitus' death. Now, why do you need to know this? Because Heraclitus hated people so much, he's really smart, and he said, in the beginning was the word, and the word undergirds everything, so there's change, things do change, but they change sensibly. We could do science. That's awesome. Good job, Heraclitus. The only problem is he hated people. Now, did this really happen to Heraclitus? We don't know for sure. We do know that's the ancient story about how he died, but people hated him so much, they told stories like that about him, whether it happened or not. You know, if you cheese everybody off, your eulogy at your funeral is gonna be an ugly sight. That's what we learned from that. Now, the second most famous resident of Ephesus was the Apostle John, who could say, yeah, Heraclitus, you got this right, but there's something more. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten son of the father. John, the apostle of love, turned God from the God of the philosophers who is out here in abstract and made you a misanthrope, somebody who hated human beings to the point that other humans hated you, he took that God from being just Logos and said, God chose by his own will to become flesh. We can see him and so love can make sense. Now maybe that's true or maybe it isn't. But in the history of ideas, what that did was this. I told you the first question I had to answer was, did I live in a cosmos or in chaos? And if science works, and more importantly, math works. Math, so abstract, and yet it works. Why does math work? Philosophers are still working on that. No, we really don't know. Why does math, which is very abstract, work? We can invent a kind of math, a hundred years later discover that we need it to solve certain scientific problems. Numbers appear to be real. If we meet aliens, we assume this. They'll know math. And we'd be able to communicate initially through math. Math, which is so abstract, seems to be universal. Now some, are so disturbed by this that they just argue that it's evolutionary hardwiring. But on the whole, mathematicians appear to, it's numbers, they're real. By the way, if you can believe in the number one, which most mathematicians do, because the number one seems to be real, it instantiates one, but that's not the number one. The word one isn't the number one. One seems to be an idea that whatever culture you live in, people run into. It's an abstract idea that seems real and it works in the real world. Why? 
Well, from the ancient philosophers forward, it's because we're probably in a cosmos, not a chaos. But notice, being in an ordered and structured universe, that's not good news, folks, necessarily. It may mean the cosmos is eternal. It just always is and was. It's ordered because it always existed. Or a really rotten God could have created it. See Heraclitus, who will make us rotten people that they tell these horrible stories about. So what's the second question that I had to answer? I couldn't believe, because I love science, that we lived in chaos. Science might work if the universe made no sense, but it probably wouldn't. The simplest explanation is that scientists come to something like the truth. And the fact that they can do that and use math to do it suggests that the universe is orderly. But then I had a second problem that I couldn't account for, and that was beauty. Beauty that I saw in my wife. Beauty that when, when I went up with my son in an airplane, and he looked out at cloud land, as he called it, he said, wow, Dad, that's beautiful. I can go to the bottom of the ocean, and it's beautiful. I can look to the farthest ends of the cosmos, and what do I see? Beauty. Notice, how could I be evolutionarily hardwired to think cloudland is beautiful? When almost no human in almost no place at almost no time has ever seen cloudland, or the farthest reaches of the cosmos, or the bottom of the ocean. What I find there may be strange, but the universe seems to be chalk a block with beauty, and the closer I look, it seems to be beauty all the way down. But if you think beauty is subjective, which is the normal response, first of all, you're wrong. Plato could show you that you are wrong, but let's assume you're right, that beauty's just in the eye of the beholder, and we're kind of lucky enough to trick ourselves into thinking everything is beautiful. Why then does beauty help us produce better logical, mathematical, computer, and scientific theories? The notion of elegance, I handed in a logic proof when I was in grad school, analytic logic, I solved the problem. It took me a hundred and some steps. I got back my paper and I received a B plus. Did I make any mistakes? No. The proof could have been done in about 40 lines. My solution was inelegant. One reason logicians don't like to solve a problem using the law of non-contradiction, a reductio, is that it's an ugly or inelegant solution. Assume falsity, show a problem, therefore truth, is inelegant, it's ugly. Science has advanced from Occam forward on the assumption that simple, elegant solutions beat inelegant solutions. After all, which was true, geocentrism or heliocentrism? Which was true? Neither. You had two false ideas based on modern science. Geocentrism, the Earth is the center of the universe, Heliocentrism, the sun is the center of the universe. What's the center of the universe? There is no center to the universe. Why was it better for us to pick heliocentrism? Because the math was more elegant, and the more elegant math, you could have made geocentrism work with ever-increasing epicycles and mathematical complexity, but because early scientists believed the cosmos was created by God and that God was good and himself beautiful, they came to prefer elegant solutions to inelegant ones. Now, you don't have to be a theist anymore to believe that because elegance works. So an atheist, if he or she is here, would simply say, of course I believe more elegant theories or simpler theories. Of course I believe Occam's razor. Not for the reason Occam did, that there was a good God, but because it works. The question is, why does it work? Maybe just because it does. Or maybe beauty, elegance, and the fact that it works on the whole points 
to something about the nature of reality. That is, that love, wonder, elegance produces love. Yes, even in a mathematician. Ever see a math geek get excited about the solution to a problem? I'm not a math geek, but I did enough logic to know that one day I was sitting, 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 trying to solve a logic problem. It was an exam so difficult you could take it home. There was one question. That was the midterm. And in, back in the day, it was impossible to cheat. So you just sat there and sat there and sat there. Couldn't solve the problem. Went to church, finally. It was a Sunday night. Older lady came up to me and said, you look, you look sad. Actually, what she meant was, you're not talking all the time. <laughs> What's wrong with you? And I said, I, God help me. What was my first thought? I mean, God help me, forgive me. It was arrogant. I, I couldn't even begin to explain to you. I thought, my problem. I didn't even understand it myself. So I said this. I said, I'm having trouble with my homework. And so she said, let me pray for you. She reached over and said, Jesus, help John Mark. She'd known me when I was a little boy, so it was like she was praying for a six-year-old. Jesus, help John Mark with his studies. Now, if you're a skeptic in the room, I'm not using this as an argument for anything. I understand the psychological reasons this could have happened, but I immediately knew how to solve the problem and went home and solved it. What had taken me days, and again, I'm not using this as an argument for the existence of God. If you don't believe in God, you can explain that away. The point is, as I saw the elegance of the solution, the beauty of it, brought love of logic to me that has never gone away. Because I suddenly realized that logic is simply logistical thinking. And that when I thought logically, I was following the logos. And that beauty produced inside of me love. And love drove me to do my work. Now, Scientists may not think of themselves as lovers, but someone really devoted to bench science or to solutions or to computer programming, they're lovers. They are so in love with finding elegant solutions that they'll stay up all night working. Love drives them. Now, those two things, that I live in a cosmos because math works, that love fills me full of wonder, that I have to have faith anyway, I can't have certainty. That this love seems to be inspired by beauty, and beauty seems to work, leads me to traditional Western theism. That just looks like God to me. Now here's the problem. God, if he exists, is so beyond me that to know him essentially will be impossible. So I would not worship God. I would have simply, I'd simply say, look, uh, science is great. It takes us so far and no further. Here's where it doesn't take me. Here's my final problem. I want to know what I should do. Because, see, I want to be in love. Someone like Hope inspires me to be in love. I can list all the facts in the universe, the is's. But the minute I think to myself, ought it to be this way, I'm stuck. Science can't help me. I know people are trying to get from is to ought just using science, but ought they to? And the minute I ask that, who am I going to ask, a scientist? In other words, the problem of evil itself suggested to me that God existed. Why? Or was necessary? if I wasn't going to live a meaningless life, because I needed to get from is to ought. It is the case that I love hope. Ought I to? It is the case sometimes that I'm angry with hope and want to strike her. Ought I to? The minute I ask those kinds of questions, I realize that science by itself isn't going to give me the resources, nor will elegance or math. 
There's a different kind of personal thinking that wondering about persons that we call ethical thinking. So having nothing to do with Christianity when I was a philosophy student and didn't want to be a Christian. I mean, I really didn't want to be a Christian. It was, I thought, career death. Was, I live in a cosmos, science works, math works, philosophy by itself often turns you into Heraclitus where you're buried in a pile of dung. I want to be in love and I want to know what I ought to do. So there seems to be more to the universe than just matter. In other words, the theater side of me said this. When I go to a play, I don't think about biochemistry or wood or paper and ink chemistry when I'm watching Hamlet. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And whether the play is on Blu-ray or my iPod streaming from Netflix or whether it's in my head replaying as a memory, it's the same thing and it's talking to me about what I ought to do, not about what is. To be or... I exist. That doesn't tell me if I ought to exist. That's what Hamlet is saying. Now, that kind of cosmos is actually bad news because it puts eternity in my heart where, as Plato would say in Symposium, I know this. Plato said, I love something. And if I love something, love is of something. But of what? I don't know, because I wouldn't be able to. The love inside of me is so great, the wonder that nothing I could know is big enough for it. So Plato had an idea. What he, we needed, he suggested, in Republic II was for someone not to seem to be just, but to be just. For someone to come from the undiscovered country, death, and report to us after death that the cosmos is just, that God is good. But ah, Plato said, if such a person existed, it would do us no good because we would take that person and whip them and then crucify them because humankind does not want the truth it would rather have a comfortable illusion. And God help us, Plato was right. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We couldn't reach God, but love came down. And though we cannot know God in his essence, the reason I'm a Christian, fundamentally, is that Christianity is the only religion of which I am aware that gives me the ability to see God in a form that I can at least understand, that allows the love in my heart to attach to something worthy of human love, the bridge between the logos of the cosmos and the logos inside my head of reason and of reason, the logos bridge that made science possible in, we in the West for the first time, was the God-man Jesus Christ who united reason and experience, sweat and analytic logic, who died and came back and reported that the undiscovered country is a place from which we can return. Why am I a Christian? Because best reason told me I could be. And in fact, suggested to me that I should be. I lived in a cosmos. Math worked. Beauty seemed to exist for the farthest reaches of the cosmos. Personality existed. And I had to explain the difference between the is of the world and my longings for an ought. 
And then finally, Christianity said, that word became flesh. Therefore, unlike Plato and Aristotle, I had some kind of mental access to God. In other words, Christianity was the solution to every intellectual problem I had. That didn't mean it was true. I asked Jesus to meet me. And though religious experience doesn't prove much, if an idea could be true and then you tried it out and it wasn't true, you'd have to abandon it. But I remember sitting in the library of the University of Rochester having walked far away from faith, surrounded by books attempting to argue myself out of this deep conviction that I'd come to that Christianity, traditional Christianity, was true. That if God spoke in a book that it's more likely to be true than false so that my working hypothesis had to be inerrancy. And I hated all of it. With every fiber of my being, I wanted to not believe because everything I wanted, I felt, was on the other side. And then I saw Jesus. And like a knight who sees the Holy Grail, love was stirred in me And what reason told me I should believe, I wanted to believe. And I've never been able to properly not believe again. Because for one brief shining moment, when I called out to him, in all my sinful vanity, the word became flesh in my heart, dwelt inside of me. And I see him in hope's eyes and in your eyes and in the common image of God in my atheist Greek professor to whom I owe everything. And I see him when I look at the mountains of Canada and I see him at the farthest reaches of the cosmos and I realize that we live in a universe moved by love, the love that moves the heavens and the furthest stars. Thank you.